This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm Brandon Pollan, and I'm one of your co-hosts. And of course, as always, I'm joined by my other half, F. Scott Field. And today, we have a very special guest today, bringing his perspective from a manager's perspective. Today, we welcome Brian Stewart. Now, Brian, thanks so much for coming on, man. appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. No, awesome. And first, before we get down to business and such, how's the, how's the little guy doing? The little guy's doing good. He uh, is on the move. If you remember from uh, some of your your peed stuff, he's uh, he's crawling and 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 creeping and furniture walking, and uh, he's getting close to eight months. So he's uh, he's mobile, which is uh, definitely scary, but equally awesome. But probably also equally good that at least he's moving and doing stuff rather than the opposite. <laughs> yes, he's, if he was sitting there as a lump, I'd be a little more worried. But it's definitely what he wants to go after and chase and do those sorts of things where it's. You got about a second before he's ready to leap off the couch. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, that's awesome, man. And, you know, and kind of a backstory here. Actually, you know, Brian and I were talking just the other day about a uh, photo for uh, the podcast for the promotional thing. And a while back, and he said, you know, I don't have that those kind of facial features anymore or stuff. And I'm like, you know, I got to ask, what made you what made you decide to go clean shaven then, man? Not that I'm judging. I'm just curious. Well, I, so just with my son seeing like whatever my face was like before. So I've had some beards, had some super long sideburns. Um, and so whatever picture you're seeing probably on like clinic page or LinkedIn or something like that, where I threw a, you know, suit and tie on. But, um, I think I had told you to check out our clinic's Instagram or, uh, yeah, Instagram page and you can see a pretty awesome, uh, mustache that occurred twice in my life. So. For those who want to go dig that up, feel free to go find it. But uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, we went just to just just for the kid, just for, and to please my wife, you know. Oh, gotcha. That's how it goes. <laughs> maybe it's if we're getting close to November, so maybe I'll uh, I'll do something <laughs> and uh, you know, men men's health awareness. That's what we'll we'll call it. There you go. And you got to get on. It's all about a matter of kind of getting up with you know Jeff Moore and Rich and their their levels and stuff. <laughs> Jeff Moore's, that's epic. I don't know if I could go that long. I think that's, uh, if I, maybe if I lived in Colorado and wore more flannel, I'd be able to pull that off. But <laughs> I don't know, a big giant red beard could be a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, you know, for those of our guests, sorry, I know we're getting a little out of topic, but uh, Brian is a partner and clinic director with California Rehabilitation and Sports Therapy in Bree, California. And you know, for our listeners who don't know a lot about you, Brian, do you think you could tell our audience, you know, who you are and tell us about your path to becoming a clinic director? Um, so I've been in practice a little over 10 years. Um, first half of my career, I worked for Concentra Medical Centers in Orange County. The last part of my working there, I was a clinic director for two years. Um, I've been with Cal Rehab now going close to five uh, in December of this year. Um, so kind of when I, I left, I interviewed for a middle management job at Concentra, didn't get it. Um, actually was the best thing that could have happened because I wanted to go into private practice. So I left, took this job, um, knowing that I had the ability to um, become a partner in the practice. And so kind of with the, the companies um, that PRN or Physical Rehabilitation Network oversees, that's kind of the model um, where usually the clinic director, you know, earns a salary, um, is incentivized for if the clinic's profitable and then also gets a distribution if they buy into a buy into the practice. So that's what kind of led me led me down that road. Um, I, you know, I was a, a staff therapist to start, but I always felt like I had a drive towards something beyond just being a staff therapist. Not that, that there's anything wrong with that. I, I felt like I took on other roles and other other things and, um, you know, treating. I, I enjoy treating, but I also enjoy the um, 
I guess, kind of the leadership or direct directorial um, aspect of the job as well. Yeah, Brian, I realize this is a very, you know, position specific kind of thing and, and it's different by company as well. But tell our listeners a little bit about what you have to do being the clinic director. Well, as a director, I, I, I treat actually about 38 to 40 hours a week that I'm scheduled seeing patients. So that's my, you know, eight to seven, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eight to one that I'm scheduled seeing patients. But on top of that, um, anything from hiring and firing, um, I've some administrative tasks as far as uh, being responsible for um, clinic efficiency, review and profit and loss statements. Um, there are some marketing aspects uh, that I do. Um, you know, relationships with referral, um, referral sources, um, different coordination with our, our kind of home office in Carlsbad, um, just email correspondence, um, disciplinary things if need be, policies and procedure, sort of, uh, I guess, implementation, um, staff training if I do, which I could probably stand to do a little bit more of, but, um, you know, as we do different things, um, you know, if new things come across um, when we have students or when we have new uh, new clinicians come on board or new um, non-clinical staff like aides or volunteers. Um, so some different things, I guess, that like that. Um, I would say, you know, even as a director, number one, I'm, I'm a therapist. So looking at the, that skill set that needs to continually improve just manual therapy basis, reading journal articles, but also from a business standpoint, understanding what if I've got bigger clinics in my area, what, what are we going to do to set ourselves apart to remain profitable and continue to grow? Um, so, you know, reading business or leadership books, nothing that was guided from my company, but just kind of what I've had to do myself to, to make the clinic a bit more um, kind of set ourselves apart. So I guess, you know, I can tell you like what a typical day entails of, of what I do, if, if that helps. Yeah, for sure. And especially because I know you said before, Brian, that you normally work, you're working full time and you're seeing patients for a lot of it. And I'm kind of curious with that even. So how, how do you balance in some of the other tasks as the director throughout that? Um, I, I get up at 5am every morning. Um, so I, yeah, I would say, you know, get up at, get up about five. Um, we were talking um, podcasts a little bit earlier. So get up, uh, get a little podcast in on my, on my way to work, um, grab some coffee, do a little bit of reading at, at Starbucks, maybe half hour, 40 minutes, whether it's a journal article or maybe a business book, get into work about seven. Um, if I didn't finish any charting from the day before, um, try to wrap that up um, on shorter days. And then I start seeing patients about eight o'clock. Um, some days I'll sneak in a 730 patient. I would say on days like like today, I got done at one. So I have the flexibility of the ability to see a pay, um uh, be on an inter or you know get interviewed for a podcast or go um go do a little bit of marketing and different things like that um so that's i kind of try to do it before or after treating if i if i need a little bit more time i'll block some time from treating but i try to still maintain some uh maintain some efficiency with my um with my ability seeing patients so it's it's getting creative either before work or maybe at lunch, I'll try and sneak in um, some things that way. Or you know, on my way home, I'll uh, I'll sneak it in that way. So every once in a blue moon, I'll I'll take a dedicated you know hat, like a like a short day off and go hit a bunch of referral sources or or tackle some other administrative tasks like that. But I try and do a little bit throughout the day for sure. Gotcha. So Brian, from your time as a director, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned about being a director? and about the PT process in general? Um, I think being a director, you have to be fairly flexible, kind of like as a treating clinician. Um, you know, you may you may have to deal with clinical, non-clinical, you know, different behaviors and attitudes. Um, you know, I would say you can't be everyone's buddy, but you can't be a royal turd either. Um, you gotta find the sweet spot between the two. Um, I think that's probably the, probably the biggest thing um, in managing people. Um, you're going to, it's kind of like managing your patients. You know, you've got the, the little old lady who might need her hand held through something, or you've got the industrial athlete who needs a swift kick in the rear end to, uh, you know, to get motivated. So I would say that, um, along with as we're treating, um, and, and kind of managing a day, that's, that's kind of how that has to happen. Um, I would say time management too, you know, sometimes it's real easy to just want to keep hammering away at, uh, 
at checking emails throughout the day. But um, if sometimes, unless it's urgent, I, I try to block time, um, maybe, you know, one of those times in the morning, um, just to keep things a little more organized. Um, I think that's the thing that email can tend to get away from you to where, you know, you see that icon on your phone or on your desktop and you, you instantly want to click on it, but it, you'll get drowned in that if you if you're not careful. Yeah, that's a good point as far as, uh, you know, just efficiency goes. I know social media and, and smartphones are really killing effectiveness and uh, efficiency these days. Um, Brian, I, just out of curiosity, let's say you have a new grad or, you know, uh, maybe some DPT students getting ready to graduate. Um, they're going out for an interview. What are some director manager type qualities they should have if that's a position they're looking to get into eventually? Um, I think uh, I think maybe starting starting with understanding a little bit with business acumen. I think that if they're going to be in a in a managerial role. Now, granted, I'm, I'm in a private practice role. I'm not in a, in a hospital-based setting where I think some of those logistics are, maybe there's more con- controlled in a hospital environment where you've got a bigger budget versus I'm in a you know, smaller private practice. Um, you know, I don't have a million therapists to, that I oversee, but um, I think business acumen, so understanding um, that with efficiency, like you want to treat, you know, you need to treat the way you treat, but at the same time, it's, it's also understanding the business side of things, not just, um, the treatment side of things, um, understanding personalities of, of, I hate to say you need a thick skin because depending on the people you, you know, you're, you're around, but I think that may help as well. Um, and those are, you know, the business acumen piece is probably not going to be the thing that you may get in PT school. Definitely not being super passive. Like you have to have a little bit of a, I don't know if it's an entrepreneurial slash type A slash, um, you know, full bore attitude, but being super passive, timid and awkward doesn't exactly help. And I'm sure, you know, maybe you guys went to, P, you know, where you guys went to PT school, I'm sure you saw both sides of that token. So certain people are going to thrive well in a, in a, in a director leadership environment. Others are going to be just fine at doing research because if they come in contact with patients, they're going to scare them. <laughs> so I, I think those sort of, those sort of attributes, um, I think help. Um, sometimes you develop some of those skills along the way, um, but I think definitely having a, that sort of skill set will, will help. Yeah, for sure. And something I've even heard too is, you know, really asking, you know, in your interview is asking what do the what does the director, what are the clinic's needs? Like what are your guys' needs and what are you guys struggling with? And then, you know, being able to address or provide ideas that you address that unique thing and being able to see things from a 30,000 foot view. At least that's something that I've heard from some of the managers that I've spoken with as well. And Brian, I'm curious on what's, if, if that holds any value, if that holds true to what you think as well. Yeah, I think, I think you have to look at it. Um, I think you have to look at both kind of, um, I mean, I, I think about what, what I do, you know, like you said, day to day, but I think it's, sometimes it's hard to take a step back, um, and look to see as you're maybe planning a budget on, how you're going to see how the rest of the, the, the year is going to go. And sometimes it's hard if you don't have enough either patience or years under your belt just to kind of understand that. Um, and sometimes you just have to be in that for a little bit of time. Um, being in a smaller clinic sometimes is a little easier to do that. But no, I think that's, um, I, I think that's key. Um, but it's not always easy. And sometimes making those bigger, bigger 30,000 foot view, um, Decisions aren't always the most popular, um, but if it's for the you know the better the betterment of the clinic or the greater good of the clinic or the organization, sometimes you have to do that. I mean, as you climb like the the corporate ladder of things, sometimes you make decisions that aren't always the most favorable. But um, when you're in a leadership role like that, you kind of have to make some some decisions like that. Sure, for sure, and. No, Brian, what if we flip the tables around? So say we a, a relatively new grad or a therapist is interviewing for a position. What are some qualities that they feel like they should look for in a manager or a director before accepting any position? I, you know, I hope some, some openness. You know, I, 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 I think openness to communication. You know, I've tried to, you know, have, you know, anyone who's interviewed with me, whether they've been a volunteer um, an aide or a PT or whoever, um, that they can, they, they can ask me questions. Um, they can, you know, bring ideas to the table. I think that sort of open communication is key. Um, if you've got a giant ego and, um, 
you're completely unapproachable, you're going to lead by fear. And I don't know if you get the best out of your employees that way versus are, do you have open communication and um, are you able to at least foster growth within that, you know, within that employee? Now, I think mentoring helps, whether that's understanding why we treat the way we treat or why we market the way we market or why we, you know, are going after a certain orthopedic group, understanding the financial aspect of, of, of treatment. Um, I think all those things, and if there's that open ability for, for growth from the, the, the new grad PT or the, the, the fresh PT who's going out to interview, um, then hopefully you're, you're going to want to work for that sort of person and you've got that open communication. It, hopefully, too, to, they're not telling you how to treat specifically, but maybe within the grand scheme, everyone's on the, fairly the same page. I, I found that I was in situations where I got hired. When I got hired on, I worked for two different clinic directors. Um, when I worked for Concentra in two different locations, three days a week at one, two days a week at the other. One was awesome. I learned a ton from the other one was not so awesome. And, um, it's, it was interesting to see kind of the, the different, um, different manager styles and, and treatment styles. And so I, I was able to kind of, you know, pick and choose on, I like this, but I don't like that. And, um, you know, if, if someone's going to tell you how to treat, then you're not going to grow as a clinician, um, or is it just as a PT in general? Um, now if you're way off base and you want to, I don't know, dunk everyone, every single person in par full body paraffin, then, okay, you're going to get yourself into a whole nother, you know, world of world of hurt there. But, um, I think having that sort of communication with the person you're working for is, is huge. For sure. Those are some good points there, Brian. And, you know, from your position being a manager and director for some time, what do you feel are some of the pros and cons of being within a management role in the rehab process? I think, uh, you know, the pros I, I like, I like where I looking at growth of something. I think that's the thing that kind of excites me a bit from, you know, where the, cl where the clinic I took over and where it's at now and, and seeing growth. That's, that's great to watch and see kind of a, a product unfold. Um, it's great to kind of mold and shape some individuals. I just had three aides this year who had been with me anywhere from two to four years who are all got into PT and OT school, which was pretty cool. Um, ones who were just volunteers that, that came on board or, or who I had hired. So that was really awesome to see. Just seeing that the, the way, the way you can kind of shape and mold, um, a clinic that's kind of like, you know, that's kind of your own. I mean, I play, you know, play sports center all day or baseball and, and l listen to my music throughout the day. And it's, it's a great fun environment and patients get better and it's, it's fun to do. And now granted that that's a pro and the benefit of being the guy who, uh, directs the thing. Now cons on the other hand, I, as I kind of, I think I alluded to, it's, it's, um, there's a fair amount of hours in the day that go into, you know, being a director and whether that's, um, anything from, uh, you know, the treating aspect to the administrative, uh, I guess if you want to call it a burden and, and all the other things that go along with that, um, I would say it's, it, it's sort of a con, but at the same time, it's, it's still, I'm, I'm learning whether it's leadership things or other things that go along with that. And that sometimes it's those decisions when you have to fire someone or you have to cut hours or you have to do things that aren't always the most favorable, but, um, it's, uh, I think it's that thing that goes along with the job. And if you've got the right people in place, um, over the course of time, that will definitely, um, make those, we you know the, the pros outweigh the cons that much more. Yeah. Good points for sure, Brian. Um, now again, thinking back to like, you know, new grads or, you know, current DPT students, um, from your perspective as a director, what do you feel like the future outlook is with regards to reimbursement from insurance companies, uh, for physical therapy services over the next maybe five to 10 years? You know, I feel like, I feel like they're, you know, I, I would love to say that all of a sudden the arrows are going to go in the right direction. Like tuition is going to go down and reimbursement's going to go up. But unfortunately those arrows go the other direction right now. And that's, that's unfortunate, but I think there's, there's other things that are out there that can help drive that. Um, I think if we, if we are providing value for what we do and we're efficient in how we do it, then insurance companies might turn the Titanic a little bit on how reimbursement is heading in our direction. Um, I think other, it's, it's, you know, a lot of, of what new grads are seeing as they're coming out, they're like, okay, well, you know, I, I want, I want to generate this salary, but unfortunately reimbursement 
and salary are kind of held held closely together. Um, I think a lot of people have seeing that saying, okay, well, if that's the case, then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the model upside down and say, I'm going to, I'm going to tie PT to CrossFit, or I'm going to tie PT in a cash-based, you know, one-on-one per hour, and I'm going to charge $150 an hour. So reimbursement on that, in that regard is just fine for the person in that niche practice who maybe has a strength and conditioning background. Um, on the whole, I think we're seeing a move towards value-based care, value-based um, medicine, like with, um, as we're seeing, like with total joint replacement um, bundling. Um, I'm actually going to be a part of a conference that's happening in February in Newport Beach of next year. Doc had reached out to me. Um, his name is uh, Dr. Zeev Kane. Uh, he's based out of UCI, and it's a it's a panel that's tied to um, value-based care and how hospital administrators, clinicians, and all these folks can can better deliver value-based care. So I think if if there's a way that value is is seen in you know then hopefully insurance companies will see that. So what patients are willing to pay versus what um, insurance companies are willing to um, to pay is a little bit of a um, dilemma. And the hard part is that there's going to be HMOs and, and me- things like Medicaid that are very low paying. Um, the, the hard part is, is there's going to be clinics out there who want, who want to survive. And what they'll do is try to, you know, cram four or five, six patients an hour because you're only getting reimbursed 30 bucks a visit. Quality of care changes. That's the, that's the crappy part. So I think if we continue to, you know, f- fight this on many fronts, there's a group in, uh, down in San Diego called IPT. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of them. Um, uh, that's the independent physical therapist of California. They're actually suing a work comp third party administrator. It's pretty wild. So, um, a line or one call, um, one call medical is a, a third party group who takes a little slice kind of out of, well, at least in California, the California work comp fee schedule. So that right there, when we see, talk about reimbursement, talk about a small group of rogue PTs in, in California who are trying to go after, you know, a big dog. Is it going to happen anytime soon? This is probably a multi-year legal, legal fight or legal battle, but, um, at least there's some other vehicles that are out there that are, you know, we're trying to change that. Uh, I know it's a really long winded answer. Sorry about that. Um, but trying to get, um, trying to get reimbursement to, to, to at least, you know, at least escalate a little bit because the only thing I've seen, I mean, I've been out 10 years. Um, the only thing I've seen is, is future PT, um, tuition only continue to escalate. So if undergrad's expensive, or if you went to private undergrad, or if you went to, I went to a private PT school, went to a zoo specific. So I've only seen that tuition go up. God forbid you go to the most expensive school that's uh, out in LA. We all know what school that is. If you're getting close to 200 grand, 250 grand in debt, and you're still coming out of school making, you know, 70 or $75,000, that's going to be really difficult to, you know, move on with your life and, and do those sorts of things. But, um, yeah, that, that hurts no matter what reimbursement is at that point. True, true. And yeah. Hopefully it will, hopefully it will continue. If we continue to show value, then that will, that will change that equation. So those arrows are going in the right direction. Yeah. Let's hope, man. Um, you know, Brian, with regards to your onboarding process that you've hired a new staff member, or a new therapist, uh, what are some methods that you find most effective, uh, when teaching new hires about your onboarding process? I don't have the most, most super formal sort of onboarding process. A lot of times, um, the, the, the therapist that we brought on, um, I only have one staff PT and we have a close to full-time and he's full-time. I have a close to full-time OT. A lot of it has been people we've had who've been students in other clinics. So they've kind of gotten a feel for, um, how kind of how the Cal rehabs operate and a little bit and kind of how we treat. Um, I would say we, I, I definitely have open lines of communication with that, um, with that PT or, or my, uh, my staff PT Scott. And if there's discussions about patient care, we, we talk, I mean, he sit, literally sits right next to me so we can discuss some of those things a bit with how, uh, how the, how the clinic is run and, and those processes there's, we, we definitely do some, some training time or if they are, um, like a PTLA, um, there's, there's some mentoring time there with co-signing notes and going over that sort of process there. Our company recently, um, 
started utilizing MedBridge for um, some training things as far as um, policy procedure, um, OSHA and some of, some of those sort of things. But um, I think they leave it up to each clinic to, to go a, a little deeper if each clinic has some different niches as far as um, say someone does um, you know CrossFit based things or more strength and conditioning aspects within within the clinic. Um, but, uh, as far as that onboarding process, I don't have the most super, super formalized, but a lot of it is we'll, we'll get in and start treating and we'll co-treat. If we need to co-treat some patients, we'll talk, um, you know, talk research articles, talk whatever needs to, whatever needs to be done. And as over time, if I start to see where some weaknesses lie, I'll, I can always pull aside and, and discuss accordingly before, um, it becomes a, you know, a problem or a long-term thing. Yeah, Brian, you bring up a really good point there because I know a lot of companies promise, you know, mentoring options and, oh, yeah, you'll have the ability to be mentored. Don't worry about it. We're not going to throw you to the wolves. But, you know, with the current financial stresses that PT clinics are going, we talked a little bit about that reimbursement issue. Um, it's getting harder and harder, it seems, to incorporate these educational and mentoring opportunities into the clinic. Um, in your opinion, maybe what are some of the best methods for trying to carve out time and, and find ways to educate and mentor staff? given the constraints that we talked about? I would say utilizing MedBridge has done well with, um, if you want to dig in deeper to little modules, like say you wanted to learn a little bit more about, um, say, instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization. Um, so kind of assigning some videos that it kind of works. Sometimes it might be on the on the clinician's own time. Sometimes it might be at lunchtime. Sometimes it might do a lunch in-service or a staff meeting that way. Um, a, a lot of times I'm six o'clock in the morning, I come across an article and I'll, I'll, I'll text it out to, uh, you know, any of my different clinicians. Um, so I think it, it, it comes across different ways, you know, blocking time in the middle of the day, or maybe coming in a little bit before work. I realize we, we typically, we fill up our schedule with, with treating. Now, sometimes just with regard to that financial piece, if there's a, you know, we typically, um, to give you an idea of how we see patients, we usually book a patient every half an hour and every hour or allow an hour for an evaluation. Um, if I have a really high functioning patient who doesn't require a ton of, of manual or a ton of, uh, if they're just a primarily a Therix patient, you know, maybe booking that patient on the 15s. And then now that allows maybe a 15 or half an hour time frame to, um, you know, allow for some, some, some mentoring time that way. Um, that's definitely something I've, I've wanted to get uh, a little bit better at and making it more of a regular thing to, to set aside time doing that. But I think that's probably the best way to do it. So to, uh, I mean, we definitely encourage, um, our clinicians and, and um, we'll pay them to do con ed. Um, we try to talk about different con ed and what they want to do, whether it's, you know, you get $1,500 as a full-time clinician. So that could be anything from APTA dues. And I've have a role in APTA, CPTA, um, from a, either a delegate role or I'm a, a, a chief rep, um, within our, our district or our County. Um, and just understanding those sorts of things back to, um, whatever sort of weekend courses they want to do, or if they're, um, looking at other books or texts or other things like that. So we definitely encourage that and try to incorporate that in the, in the treating day. I think trying to, to go a bit beyond that can make it a little tough. Yeah, I don't know. I've got a newborn as well, Brian. And if you wake me up with a 6 a.m. text for research articles, you're going to get a stern talking to when I get in. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but none, of my, none of my clinicians do. I, so I can... Uh, I try to keep the 6 a.m. text unless I get, you know, or I'm listening to a, a podcast and I'm forwarding that to someone. <laughs> so I try not to do that too often, but I know if I don't do it, then I don't know if there's only a way to like delay a text message, you know, like you can right, right. delay. Um, well, fair, fair enough. You can send uh, a link to our podcast here anytime you want. We'll allow that. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> there you I don't go. care if I'm waking people up. I'll do it for sure. So, Brian, another topic that's probably not as fun to deal with or to deal with for that matter resolves around um, confrontation issues. So sometimes I'm, I'm sure it happens, of course, that a patient has a complaint about something, whether it be about a billing issue, dissatisfaction with an outcome, they didn't like something that a staff member did or said, or I'm sure the list continues and you probably heard more than I have, but but you know, but let's put a hypothetical situation here, and let's let's pretend that you're about to have a meeting with a very upset patient about a billing issue. 
you know, what are some steps that you go about through and what are some things that you normally do to help handle that situation? Well, I, I've been in that situation. I've tried to, I think, gather as much information as possible. Um, and definitely if a patient's irate, you gotta, you gotta diffuse that bomb. Um, unfortunately it's the patient's going to be, you know, like for us, our billing department is, is handled in, in Carlsbad. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a phone number in this kind of nebulous location. So, so for me, I definitely want to calm the patient down as much as I can because an, an upset patient's going to go tell 10 other 10, 10 people that they know that, oh yeah, Brian down at Cal Rehab, all he's worried about is money and he's trying to, uh, you know, stick me for whatever bill. Um, so I think gathering as much info as you can from the billing side, from our front desk person, if she's managed some of that, get as much information. And then from there I can, um, you know, make the best educated decision on, on how that was handled. Yeah, for sure. And you bring up a couple of good points there, Brian. And, you know, in terms of your interaction with the patient now, and I'm going to switch. So say, for example, that patient had an issue with a particular staff member. What have you found to be the most effective method for follow-up with that particular staff member after hearing that patient, patient complaint against that staff member? Like, how do you handle the aftermath and addressing that staff member? Um, you know what? I would try to set, you know, maybe a, a goal if it was something like... I think I'd look at the severity of, of the complaint. And then from there, I would try to, um, you know, maybe set a goal of, you know, was it a, the time somebody was treated or did, were they, um, was someone a little heavy handed, um, was say a manual therapy technique. I, you know, I've had to have that sort of discussion. Um, so I think at least setting a goal to say, okay, let's, let's look to see how this patient bounces back over the next, over the next few weeks and see if we can, you know, avoid whatever, you know, manual therapy treatment technique that you did, or maybe don't bring up a topic of, I don't know, politics or religion in the clinic. If you happen to do that, I haven't run into that situation, but if you're, you know, if you've got some smarts, you don't bring up those two topics. It's just one of those things you know, you don't do, but I think setting a goal of, um, trying to improve on whatever that, that, if you want to call it an impairment or dysfunction that they, that they came across and maybe follow up in, you know, a few weeks or a month to see how that, how that changed. If it's a chronic thing, then, you, you know, maybe a more formal sit down discussion review. And then does it need to get to the point of hefty, you know, I'm having you sign things now and now I have to put you on contract or that sort of thing. Usually, you know, war warnings and write-ups, usually stern warnings do well, but if you have to get to the point of writing people up, then you're, you're going down a path that's sometimes you have to do it, but other times, you know, if it's a, if the person's a cancer in your clinic, um, whether they're an aide or a, a, a clinician, um, you definitely, you know, you want to get that person out of the clinic if it's truly that sort of situation, or if it's more patient driven, you know, uh, we're going to have patients. I, I know you guys have maybe, I don't know if you've experienced it, but you'll have a patient who you're just not going to please them. And maybe, we're, you know, at that point, maybe we're not the right clinic for that patient, or you just try to discharge them as fast as possible and get them back to feeling better, kill them with kindness. So you've got a few different options there depending on the severity of the problem. But um, sometimes you have to take the the PC route. Other times you have to take the, you got to make a stern decision about something. And it's not always favorable, but um, sometimes you got to do it. Yeah, Brian, while we're on the conflict train here, let's say you've got two staff members that are having an issue. What what kind of effect, effective strategies do you use to kind of deal with that, you know, staff member on staff member type conflicts? I would probably talk with, again, gather as much information, talk with each one of them individually first, and then kind of bring the two together and say, okay, this is the information I've got. This is what's in front of me. This is what you're telling me. This is what you're telling me how are we going to move forward with this and kind of make it a, a team approach that way? Um, unless it's like a blatant, just blatant, blatantly, you know, someone's putting, you know, someone in a, a compromising or legal issue, then I'm, and it's pretty clear cut, then I can make a decision one way versus the other. If it's two clinicians, I, I would like to keep both employed working for me. Um, then it might be not the most, most comfortable thing for those two people. But I think if the, the three of us sit down and discuss something, you know, cause it's real easy for, if I sit down with one, oh, well, so-and-so did so-and-so did this, that, and the other thing. Okay. 
And then I, I hear the same thing from someone else. It's easy to hide, hide behind your accusations versus, okay, well, this person's now sitting across from you. You want to say that same thing again? And now we'll see where, you know, what's the true situation versus what's, you know, a load of BS. Yeah, for sure. No, that's a good take on that, Brian. And now I say, I'll say we can safely get off the uh, conflict train here and we'll switch it to different, a different track here. Um, <laughs> so what are some questions that a PT should ask themselves to see if being a manager or a director is right for them? I think, do they want to, do they want to be involved with, um, you know, do they like the, 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 the challenges that go beyond, that go beyond patient care? Um, do they, do they work well with many different personalities and, and, you know, behavior types? Do they, you know, if they're going to be a manager director, are they feel comfortable marketing to referral sources? Do they feel comfortable with, um, you know, something that's beyond a, just a nine to five job? Um, I, I think my, my other things that go on outside of, um, my other consulting things or, you know, involvement in the org in our state or national organizations. I think that kind of goes along, along the lines with that, where if someone's just fine punching in and punching out, then they're probably not going to want to be a director. Um, and that's just one guy's opinion. But, um, I think when there's that little bit of a drive that's beyond, that's beyond patient care, I think that's something else they'll have to ask themselves if they want to dig, a little deeper into that. Um, I don't know if everyone's a natural born leader or, or, a, you know, manager in, in that regard. And I think if, if they're going to have to make, you know, kind of back to those conflict things, if they're going to have to make those, um, those kind of tough decisions, um, with conflict or with, um, hiring and firing and some of those things that aren't always the most savory, then it might be, you know, if it's not for them, um, then that might, you know, a, a director role might not be for them. Yeah, that's a good point, Brian. You mentioned uh, you do listen to a couple of podcasts and you do a lot of reading here and there. What are some resources that you've found most beneficial with transitioning into a manager director position? I would say I've, I've tried to, over the last couple of years, um, kind of really understand um, like the kind of the PT business side of things. So, you know, even if it's if it's different business books, I mean, I would say I read, you know, like Entrepreneur Inc. Fortune, just as much as I read JOSPT um, or, or uh, the PT Journal or um, you know the journals and things that are uh, you know associated with like um, sports or uh, the ortho sections. Um, being a private practice section member, that's definitely helped. Even just networking at conferences, um, Twitter's been a big, a big thing in, in gathering information just from a, just an overall perspective. I, I think Jerry Durham has some, some good things to say about just the patient in general, even, even gathering information that way and just how, you know, the outlook of, of the clinic, um, would be, I think has, has helped. EIM's got some good stuff. There's definitely, I, I don't know if I look at my, my, my podcast feed, I've definitely got a fair amount of PT based slash leadership things, um, that, that are kind of tied into there. So I think that's a good way to consume information in short bits. Um, but yeah, definitely some, some business books um, have helped just in my um, kind of leadership roles in, in that regard. Um, there's a book uh, my uh, one of our, our senior leaders had uh, asked me to read. It was called uh, Talk About the Silent Leadership and just really just listening. A, a lot of it is just, just tied to listening. So I think it's, I, I think you have to look sometimes even outside of PT for, for, for some of that guidance, like I could reference some of those magazines or other, um, you know, Twitter feeds or following other people. Um, it might be what's been successful in other realms and other businesses that I think a lot of times we can gather more information um, that way versus, you know, it's real easy to, to go to the, the certain gurus um, within PT, but, you know, sometimes there's some other successful entrepreneurs or, or, or business leaders that, um, have done well that are outside our our, uh, our silo. Yeah, for sure. It's like a matter of seeing all these different perspectives from not even within the profession, but outside and see kind of one you feel works best to get your target audience and based on your demographics. So I think that's a really, really good point on that, Brian. You know, we kind of usually, Brian, like to ask this question at the end of every episode to get everyone's take on it. We've had a wide variety of answers and we've had a lot of good ones. Actually, they've all been good. I haven't actually heard a bad one, but the question is, if you could change one aspect of DPT education, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? I think 
and this is going to be a little biased being a guy working in private practice, I, I think a little bit more business education, and you'll, you'll probably hear that from not just me, but from some other folks. I think um, if, if it was an elective or if there was, you know, towards the end of that third year, depending on how much time you've got left for something, if there was a little time, you know, dedicated to that, I think it would be great because so many people go into private practice yet sometimes they go work for someone or, or go into it. I don't want to say blindly, but it's, it's, and you're not going to get it all in, in three or four weeks, but at least if you've got a, a better taste of it, it might help. Um, even if there was some sort of a, if you wanted to call it like an elective type class that kind of, pr you know, primered you to, if you're going to do a residency or fellowship or something along those lines that could kind of, you know, cause you do all your, at least for me, you know, you do a year and a half of, of school stuff, maybe you got a little two week or snuck in there. I did four, six week rotations, came back to a little more school, then did a, I did two months, um, treat my league baseball players in Arizona, came back and then graduated in December. So I had a month after I got back from what was called or what within the, the curriculum, a, a residency. So some people did three days a week with some mentoring in like an ortho clinic but i think if there's a way to organize you know if you've got kind of a direction you want to head that granted you know dpt education is based on you pass an board, a national board exam um so there's going to be things that you were learning way back when in year one that because it's on an exam you're learning like the really awesome benefits of fluid therapy to me it's like great awesome okay that's really fantastic but i want to open a clinic and treat you know higher level baseball players, you know, athletes. So I think if there was a way to kind of curtail that, if there's any, you know, available time into that third year that kind of would maybe lead you um, in that regard, I think would be great. Um, I know that's easier said than done, but uh, I think if there's a, a way to, to sneak that in there, um, I think that would be great, but I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, I think uh, most of us agree we could all use a little more uh, business education uh, at some point in our DPT careers. Well, Brian, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Um, you know, we, we really appreciate your insight on uh, just your role in being a director. And uh, I, I know it will provide value not only for, for me and Brandon, but for our, our listening audience as well. Um, would you mind telling us where people can find you online and on social media? I would say uh, you could find me on Twitter at Dr. Brian Stewart, or you could find us. Uh, yeah, that's probably the best way. And if you have a, any questions for me, you can always direct message me that way. Um, I got too many email addresses to keep track of. Not that I don't want to share them, but um, I think direct message, I can kind of keep track. And if you happen to mention this podcast, I can at least try to try to reference that if anyone wants to, you know, get in touch that way. But um more than willing to ask, answer any questions that any of your audience has. Awesome. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.